Okay, it is 7.30 right now, and we are going to get started. Uh, good evening. My name is Nancy Howell. I'm on the board of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and we're going to go through a, a few messages, uh, things that are happening, things that are coming up, things that you'd be interested in. Folks on Zoom, again, take a look uh, and see what we have when, when we show you the slides. I have a feeling there'll be a few more folks drifting in, but um, yeah, let's, let's get started, Michelle. Thank Okay, next. All righty. So again, I hope everyone's doing fine. Um, please, I'm going to talk about being a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon uh, through our e-newsletter or becoming a member uh, if you haven't already renewed. Um, World Migratory Bird Day, which is the second Saturday of October, um, the Audubon Great Lakes Chapter Gathering, uh, the November speaker program, and I'm going to say this over and over again, it is going to be Zoom only. You know why? Election day! And the, and the library will be closed for polling so or for uh, the uh, voting. So it'll be Zoom only, but it'll be a great program. And then, uh, oh yeah, let's start thinking about Christmas, the Christmas bird count. Next, please. So as I mentioned, uh, please do uh, sign up e through our for our e newsletter that comes out uh, weekly, generally Tuesdays, sometimes Wednesdays. It's updated information as to what is happening. Uh, programs sometimes things happen real suddenly. We want to toss something out real quickly, and of course, become a member or you can renew your membership uh, to Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Just hit the website and find the. Uh, tile that says membership. How about that? Next, please. As I mentioned, the World Migratory Bird Day, uh, there that happens two times a year, uh, May and October, during peaks of migration. And of course, we always want to celebrate birds, but we also need to celebrate the habitats and the foods they need, especially insects. Yep, all of, a lot of those migrants that are coming uh, south now, they're eating fruit, but they're also picking off caterpillars and stuff and little tiny bugs. So again, really get the bugs in your yard. Get the bugs back. Uh, do something to help. Don't mow all your lawn. Uh, turn in some data via eBird. Um, plant native plants. Help out with lights out. Uh, I've been keeping track of the lights out birds that have, have run into buildings downtown and it was a little slow, but now it's starting to pick up again. So we're really watching the Rocket Mortgage Field House windows that they put the bird-friendly window treatment on. Next, please. And uh, the Audubon Great Lakes, uh, there is a chapter gathering on Friday, October 18th through Sunday, October 20th. Um, there's five states that are involved with lots of chapters and if somebody is interested for uh, to attend from western cuyahoga audubon we'd love to have you attend and um, do on some of the field trips attend some of the sessions um, tell everybody what great things we do like our book discussion and more so um yeah i just put that up there and we'll have it in our our upcoming newsletter and our e-blast as well too Next, Christmas bird count. All right, so I just wanted to do a real quick uh, push for this. We always need participants. Uh, our count will take place on Saturday, December 28th. It's a one day thing for our, our circle. That's called the Lakewood Circle. Um, I need somebody out in the lake. Kidding, kidding. Uh, but, you know, if Lake Erie doesn't freeze, uh, we may send somebody out in the lake at some point, not to swim, but to boat. But you can see our circle does cross into Lorraine County. It's okay. It, remember, this is our, our circle area. Down past Berea, Olmstead Falls, basically I use the turnpike as our, our ending point down further south. To the east, you see the Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn Heights just barely hits uh, Parma Heights. Uh, so the Tri-C West Campus and a couple of other places there. Uh, we do hit a lot of the park systems, the green spaces that are, that are near, but neighborhoods, cemeteries, 
places like that, please, please, please get a hold of me. I'm the compiler for the count. And it's a great time to have your family involved, maybe have friends in town and just walking for a half an hour, watching your bird feeder. As long as it's, as it's in this count circle, birds count. Next. All righty, Michelle. All right. Hello. 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 Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm going to be talking about uh, the upcoming bird walks this month, as well as how you can connect with us on social media. Um, really quick before I get started with my slides, I am running the Zoom tonight. Zoomers, uh, we can hear you loud and clear in the room if you come off mute. You, my computer is hooked up to the speakers in the room, so just keep that in mind. Um, only come off mute if you want to speak a question and then please put yourself back on. Um, likewise, in the room, they cannot hear us unless we're speaking into a mic. So if you have a question, raise your hand. We've got two mics. We'll get a mic to you uh, so you can speak your question. All right. So uh, the second Saturday bird walk is not this Saturday, but next Saturday, October 12th at 9 a.m. We meet at the Rocky River Nature Center um, in the parking between the upper and lower parking lots. And then we take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails uh, Bill Dininger, Dave Grasskemper, uh, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for that walk. Uh, so hope to see you in a couple weeks at that walk. We have the Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk. Um, that's the fourth Saturday of every month. Uh, this month, it is October 26th at 9 a.m. We meet at the um, Cleveland Metro Parks Towpath parking lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of the former Sokolowski's University Inn. Um, and then we walk north, that'd be north through Scranton Flats. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a nice walk. It's very urban. Um, we've seen some real changes there, but still plenty of birds. Uh, and Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for that walk. And then this is a November walk, but it's happening before we have our next member meeting. So I want to announce it now. Um, Al Rand is taking us on a field trip to Litchfield Wetland Nature Preserve. Uh, that will be on November 2nd at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, and we have the address right there on the slide. And so hope to see you for that walk. I think this is our first time having a field trip at this location. So please come and check it out with us. And then finally, uh, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook. Twitter, or X, formerly Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, these uh, speaker series meetings are all recorded. I put them all on YouTube, so please be sure to subscribe. Also, the book club will be on Zoom. I record those and put those on YouTube as well. So if you can't tune into any of those meetings, uh, you can find us there. All right, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. And I did want to mention that our next newsletter is going to be coming out uh, at the end of October. So a lot of this information will be on there. Plus, again, the e-newsletter. And now Marianne Romito, our uh, climate change coordinator. Climate watch, sorry. She coordinates climate change, too. <laughs> no, Blame her. Hey. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming tonight. Um, I am the Northeast Ohio regional, whatever, um, coordinator for the Climate Watch program, which is put on by National Audubon. And it's a great way to help Audubon get uh, data for their, their um, what's the name of that thing? The uh, survival by degrees pro the thing that you heard that back in 2019, they put out this big alert that we're losing 50% of our birds or 30%, whatever it was. I'm sorry, um, but we're losing a lot of our birds. And the data that we can provide with these surveys is very helpful for National Audubon. So you can keep going. Yeah, the, the, ne the, the next climate watch change is gonna be from the climate watch surveys are gonna be between January 15th and, Janu and February 15th. So if you're interested in doing this, give me a call. And here's my contact information. Take a picture of this screen so that you can get hold of me. Any other questions or any questions? Okay. Thank you, Marianne. 
Yeah, we do a, a, watch, a climate watch survey in the spring, uh, or actually summer and winter. So there's two times a year, uh, 12 points at, at a site where Marianne would say, hey, we need somebody to do this area. And you pick out the, uh, the, the 12 points, and there's only five birds that you have to list down. Goldfinch, white-breasted nuthatch, red-breasted nuthatch, eastern bluebird, and eastern towhee. Mm -hmm. So, you know, easy. Next. All right, Drina Nemes and our book discussion. Always good. Howdy, everybody. Next slide, please. Well, our next book discussion is in only two weeks from tonight. And the book is 10 Birds That Changed the World by Stephen Moss. And you can see on the cover of the book, there are 10 birds. And the emperor penguin is one of the featured birds. It's the last chapter. And uh, there's quite a bit that goes before we get to this last chapter, of course. And uh, related to what Marianne was saying about climate change, there is a theme throughout this book about not only climate change, but climate emergency. And uh, as I've been reading this, I've been reminded, yes, that we're in a we're in more of an emergency state than we commonly than I have gotten into accustomed to. I think maybe to not get too anxious about things. So the Emperor Penguin fits in very well with this idea of climate emergency and what is the fate of these emperor penguins. Next slide, please. And then another chapter is about the Eurasian tree sparrow. And it takes place in China, and it gets into Chinese politics and the natural history of the bird and what resulted from political action against a sparrow. And then we have the Guane cormorant. This was most interesting. If you can imagine uh, a, a tropical kind of scene in, in, uh, off the coast of South America and lots of cormorants that make lots of guano and they it's dripping all over the cliffs but there's no rain so it doesn't wash away and it ends up with 50 meters thick of guano and how that is then capitalized and uh what happens in that situation what happens with these birds that are just doing their own thing very interesting. Next slide, please. So this is Stephen Moss, and uh, he lives in uh, Somerset, England right now. He is a naturalist, a historian, and uh, he was he's very well known in England for his television produces, producings on uh, nature. And he was very active with that in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, and into the 10s, too, the teens. And um, now he's moved into more into teaching, and also he teaches a class on natural history writing and travel writing. Next slide, please. So um, also then for the rest of the year, we'll be in January, we're, we'll be discussing the birds that Audubon missed. And then in April, the big year, um, a tale of man, nature and fall obsession. Next slide, please. And I'm suggesting that the, we watch the movie, too, and we can discuss both of them when we meet in um, in April for that. And the movie is uh, available in, in many on many platforms for streaming or renting. It's also a DVD is available at the Cleveland Public Library. Next slide, please. OK, coincidentally, David Lindo is a great mate mate of Stephen Moss. They're good friends. And I uh, do like David Lindo's In Conservation with series of webinars. And he has three interviews with Stephen Moss uh, within the last four years. And David has even asked Stephen to write his obituary. <laughs> so <laughs> you know that there must be great mates. So, but coming up November 11th at 7 p.m., Greenwich time, 
uh, program North American Flycatchers, unlock, Unlocking the Most Difficult Birds to Identify. So these programs that David Lindo hosts are very, very good. Um, so you can access either to see what the cur what the uh, webinars are coming up, or you can also see them at past meetings at urbanbirderworld.com. Next slide, please. And then you can just uh, see all of our other book discussions from seasons one through four. We're starting season five at, uh, at our website. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. Uh, Amanda Sobrowski couldn't be here. She's our, our Bird Friendly Coffee Coordinator. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, Bird Friendly Coffee sold through uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon, or if you order through Western Cuyahoga Audubon, um, we benefit a little bit. There's some proceeds that we get from the sales. Um, we order four times a year. The next order is going in on October 10th. It is going in on October 10th. So get your order in between now and October 9th. Uh, there's a whole array of grinds and roasts of and sizes of bags of this coffee. And as you can see, it is uh, ensures that the rainforest is not uh, cut, uh, leaves have, which leaves the habitat intact. It provides uh, farmers a living wage. No pesticides or herbicides are used because the coffee is grown in its natural state, in the shade as coffee should be grown, not sun-grown coffee, which was has been developed through some of the bigger coffee producers that, you, you know, the brands that you see at the store. So it's it's very good. So Get the info, get your uh, orders in. You can get it from our uh, website, our homepage. So don't wait. All right. Next. Um, did you want to talk about the t shirts? And t shirts in the back of the room? Yeah. Yeah. We have. Um... From our 2019 event with David Lindo, we have some leftover t-shirts that we are giving away. So they're a, a pretty um, yellow goldish color. Um, please, on your way out, stop by the table and get your free t-shirt. Yeah, it says um, Urban Birding on it. and Yeah, Urban Birding Cleveland. Yep. And then and on the then... back has a list of our sponsors for the event. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and there, if, if you want to drop a donation, either in the little basket back there or think about just dropping a donation to Western Cuyahoga Audubon, that would be awesome. There's different sizes. The ribbons on them indicate the sizes. So before you leave, take a look. There you go. All right. The softest T-shirts ever <laughs> made out of feathers, right? <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> All righty. So in November, we have a, a special, a nice sp special program. Again, since the, the library is closed, it is going to be a Zoom only. So again, we will be sending you the Zoom link several times. But Jamie Emmert, who's the avian education coordinator for the Ohio Division of uh, Natural Resources, is going to talk about the evolution of the Lake Erie birding trail. Maybe you've seen those signs at various places along the lake. There's a, a black crowned night heron and it says Lake Erie birding trail and then there's a number and there's a book that goes along with that. And I think there's probably something on a website as well too, but uh, Jamie's going to be talking about how she's working on upgrading that and making it uh, certainly more user-friendly uh, on your phone. So November 5th, Tuesday, this time seven o'clock. Okay. All righty. But this evening, we have one of our members, uh, Andrew Steinman, who uh, not only is a member, he's an author, a photographer, and I added a scholar because, yeah, let's go to the next slide. You will just, uh, amazing. Uh, Andrew Steinman is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Theology and Hebrew at Concordia University, Chicago. He is the author of 20 books on the Old Testament, Biblical uh, Chronology, Biblical Hebrew Grammar, and Ancient Aramaic Grammar. 
And that's what he's going to speak tonight, right? <laughs> Since retiring, he has resided in Westlake with his wife, Rebecca. He and his he has been birding for almost a quarter century. They've observed over 1,600 bird species in the wild on six continents. Dr. Steinman is an avid wildlife photographer, and some of his bird photos have been featured on eBird's Explore Species pages, including the cocoa thrush, northern scrub flycatcher, scrub flycatcher, uh, the golden olive woodpecker, and the white neck jacobin. So without any further ado, let's welcome Dr. Andrew Steinman. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Um, there we go. She's going to get my uh, presentation up there. Um, I'm going to talk about a little trip we took back in, was it June? Yeah, it was June. I'm looking at my wife to make sure I got that right. Uh, yeah. Um, to what's sometimes called the heart of the Amazon. Um, I've got kind of the area circled in uh, red there. So we're not way up in the, uh, you know, source of the Amazon over here in Ecuador and Colombia, nor are we down here by the mouth of the Amazon. But we're here uh, in the city of Manaus is where we start out. Uh, it's an interesting trip to get there. We had to fly to um, Miami and we had to fly to Panama City, Panama, and then we had to fly to Manaus. So it took us about 24 hours to get to Manas, and then on the return trip, it took us about 24 hours to get home when we had to fly through Houston, I think it was, uh, to get home. Um, Manas is a, a big city. You can see it there. Uh, here's the Amazon River and all the high rises in Manas. Uh, Manas is a very old city, though. It, it dates from the 17th century. Uh, so people have been, uh, Europeans have been living there. Uh, since the 17th century, obviously uh, native uh, indigenous peoples there much longer. Um, they have, you can see here, a big fish market. Um, fish is the, probably their primary protein here uh, in this part of the uh, Amazon. And you can see just booths and booths and booths of uh, fish at the fish market. During the 19th century, there was a rubber boom uh, in the Amazon, uh, the first kind of place, the first place really where uh, rubber was harvested commercially. Um, and so you had a lot of Europeans that moved into the area of Manas, and it, they tried to make it what they called the Paris of the Amazon. Uh, this is the opera house from that era. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's, it's uh, quite uh, in the European style. And uh, as you see, the old part of Manas go through it. Uh, you see uh, a bunch of um, uh, kind of uh, mansions that were built by the rubber barons uh, and their um, kind of ornate uh, 19th century European style. So, uh, you know, when you go uh, there, uh, you don't think right away you're going to be plunged into the jungle uh, because you get to Manas. Uh, the interesting thing about it, though, is they only have flights to Manas five days a week. So when we got done, we actually had 36 hours um, that we had to wait around to get a flight out. And so we, uh, we got a little tour of the city, uh, and uh, including the smelly fish market, of course. Um, so in this area, you get the Amazon and you get some of its uh, tributaries. Uh, the Amazon is a huge river. Now, you can see the opposite bank way over there. Okay, uh, it, it's hard to uh, comprehend how big uh, the Amazon River is. Uh, here we have um, two rivers coming together. The, the Blackwater River here um, is one of the tributaries of the Amazon, and the, the uh, muddy water is the Amazon itself, and notice they don't mix too well. Um, but we actually went up some of these tributaries to the Amazon as well as... Um, going on the Amazon itself. So uh, we got to see a lot of this area over, um, I could think it was about eight days we were on the boat. 
Um, this is the boat we are on. We are on a Rhodes Scholar trip. You can see the Rhodes Scholar sign there. There We were a group of uh, 17. And it wasn't um, a dedicated birding trip. It was uh, kind of a wildlife uh, trip um, advertised to show us wildlife and, and the flora uh, of this part of the world. Um, and you see most of it from skiffs. These, these, this is one of the skiffs you get got on. There were two of them. We would split up uh, every day or sometimes at night we would go out um, to do some owling at night. Uh, and they call these things canoes. They're not canoes at all. They had an outboard motor on the back. Um, you know, um, but you zip around the little inlets um, and that's where you're going to see the wildlife. Actually, when you walk in the jungle, and we did that on a couple of occasions, um, the only thing you're going to see there are plants uh, and ants. And we had this thing about make sure you tuck your pants in because you don't want any ants coming up your legs because uh, they bite. And in fact, they have one particular ant they call the bullet ant. And we were told it was named that because it, when they bit you, it felt like you'd been shot by a bullet. I've never been shot by a bullet, but um, I didn't want to find out what it felt like either. So, um, But in the jungle, you don't really see birds. Uh, they're way up in the canopy, uh, and you can't see them. Um, you might uh, see a, a monkey or something like that, but we didn't see pretty much any uh, animal life. Uh, other than um, uh, the ants while we were uh, in the jungle itself. Most of the time you see the wildlife uh, when you're on these skiffs going around uh, the shore of the Amazon or most of the time Amazon or Rio Negro that we were on. Well, let's start out with some city birds. There are a number of birds that have adapted to city life in this part of the, the world. Um, Tropical kingbird, um, maybe if you've been to Central America, you might have seen uh, tropical kingbirds, uh, fairly common. Uh, they're very good at uh, adapting uh, to human habitations. And uh, we saw this one right behind our hotel uh, the first uh, day we were there. Um, Yellow-browed sparrow uh, is a quite a striking bird. You, when you see it, even when you're, you know, like 15, 20 yards away, that that yellow brow on it uh, really stands out. It's, it's quite a striking bird. And we saw maybe two or three of those just um, digging around uh, a bank uh, beside a road, uh, looking for uh, whatever insects they could get. A variegated flycatcher, uh, a little bit uh, more rare bird. Uh, we found this one uh, obviously on a wire uh, as we were uh, walking down a back road uh, behind our hotel. Uh, and uh, don't see those too often. Now, I have house wren up here. You're going, why house wren, right? Well, this is the southern uh, house wren. And Michelle, if you could click on the house wren. Yeah. There. This is a southern house wren. This is a northern house wren like we have around here. And you can see the difference. The mantle on the southern house wren is uh, much darker uh, than the mantle on the northern house wren. They both still have this little white on the edge of the wings, but not quite as pronounced maybe on the uh, southern house wren. Now, I, I don't know if you know this, but the house wren species is being split into seven this year with the new taxonomy. Um, there's the northern house wren and the southern house wren, and then there are five different wrens on various islands in the Caribbean. Um, so if you've been to South America and seen house wren, you're going to get a, a, an extra bird on your list. And in fact, I, my wife and I are going to get two extra birds because we've been to Cozumel and seen the Cozumel wren. So um, we actually get uh, two extra birds. So it's, it's being split uh, five ways. But when you see this, oh, um, it, it very much looks like a house wren, except for it's much darker, that, that kind of chocolate brown. Uh, so we were looking at going, is that really what we think it is? It sounds like a house wren, um, but it's, it's very clearly not a house wren. If you could do the southern house wren again, we'll, it'll take us back to where we were. 
Um, blue gray tanager, very common bird in Central and South America. But again, it comes in a number of varieties. And Michelle, if you could click on the blue gray, blue gray tanager. Uh, here are three of the varieties that uh, we have seen. The one you see uh, in South America along the Amazon is the white edged, referring to this kind of white on the shoulder that you see there. Uh, most of them as you see in Central America, and this one I think I took a picture in Panama, um, you can see the, the breast and, and, and so forth, the, and, and uh, under to the, all the way to the underwing coverts um, and, and the undertail coverts are, are uh, gray as opposed to much whiter here. Uh, and the blue is a, a darker blue. On the other hand, if you go to ever get to Tobago, um, uh, island kind of north of uh, Venezuela there, uh, this is a, a picture of a bird I took in uh, Tobago. You can see it's much more of a pale blue, uh, both on the head and the breast, and a kind of a bright blue on the wings. So this bird comes in a number of different plumages, um, and they're kind of specific to the area that you're in. Uh, so if you've been to uh, Central America, you've probably seen blue-gray tanagers. They're very, very common birds. Um, but you probably haven't seen the variety uh, that you would find uh, in and around uh, the Amazon, especially around uh, Manaus. So again, if you could click on the white-edged version of the blue-gray tanager. Um, so these are, are some of the birds that we just happened to see around uh, Manaus before. Uh, we got on the ship the first morning. Now, eventually, we made it to Novo Arroyo, which is a smaller town um, uh, further up the Amazon. Uh, but again, you see a number of birds that have adapted well to life with humans. Uh, the boat-billed flycatcher, again, a, a common flycatcher in Central and South America, de definitely named after that big bill. Um, and it looks very similar to, to the uh, flycatcher we saw earlier in Manaus. It's a little bit bigger overall, and the yellow is, is a little bit uh, more intense. And very similar to it is the white-throated kingbird. Um, the other kingbird looks almost like this, but doesn't have this white throat. So uh, you have to look carefully at, at these uh, kingbirds uh, when you see them down there. Banana quits, very common, uh, Central America, South America, all over the Caribbean, and they still have them down there. And ruddy ground doves, too, are very common. Um, this one's uh, kind of being um, uncooperative. He's not on the ground, right? So, uh, but we actually found him on a, a wire as we were walking around Novo Arroyo. Uh, Novo Arroyo is, a, is an interesting uh, little city. Uh, it's only been around for a about 50, 60 years. Uh, there is the uh, old city of Araya, which we actually visited, which has kind of been given back to the jungles. You can only go and see the ruins of it. It had been there for about 300 years, um, but eventually um, it was abandoned and they moved to Novo Araya, New Araya, um, about 50, 60 years ago. Um, but since then, the birds have very well adapted to city life. And these are our common kind of city life birds that you will find there uh, in the Amazon region. Um, when you go up and down the river, there are a number of birds that are, are fairly common. Uh, the white-winged swallows are very much, uh, they look very much like our tree swallows. But as you can, whoops, as you can see, they have this white, patch on their wings. Um, and you see them most often in flight, um, occasionally on a branch like this along the river. Southern lap wings, uh, again, a very common bird. You might see those if you've been to uh, Central America somewhere. Um, and you see them all over um, the, the river banks and along the shore. Uh, two birds here in this picture, the the Neotropic cormorants, of course, you can see in southern United States, too. Um, and occasionally, they make a, a, a show up north. I remember seeing one in the Chicago area when we lived in Chicago. Um, but they're mostly in the southern United States, but they're all the way down in South America. And then one bird that you uh, won't see in the United States is the large-billed terns, appropriately named, as you can see, 
They have pretty large bills, um, and uh, they hang around uh, the Amazon River. I don't think we saw any on the Rio Negro, but on the Amazon River, um, we saw them uh, fairly commonly flying uh, up and down the river looking for whatever fish they could eat. Um, so, you know, very common river birds. Um, Wattle Jacana is um, another common bird along the rivers. You might again find a different variety of uh, Wattle Jacana in uh, Central America. This is the chestnut backed one, as you, as you can see. Uh, but the um, other other variety with a different color back you're going to find in uh, Central America. Lesser Kiskadees. Um, lesser Kiskadees I find very difficult to, to distinguish from greater Kiskadees. Now, if you've been down to Texas, you might have seen a greater Kiskadee. Uh, and it's hard to tell them apart even by their call because their call sounds like Kiskadee, right? And, and that's true for lesser or greater. Um, the lesser are, according to its name, smaller, but of course, if you don't see them right next to one another, sometimes it's hard to tell whether you're seeing a lesser or a greater kiskadee. But down in the Amazon, you're much more likely to see a lesser kiskadee than you are a greater kiskadee. We saw maybe two or three greater kiskadees, but we probably saw 20 or 30 uh, of the lesser kiskadees. Uh, swallowing puff birds, uh, very common. We saw them all over the place. They have this kind of nice little um, reddish on their on their legs. The the feathers are a little reddish. Otherwise, they're just kind of a a dark bird uh, that you see um, perched around and flying around catching insects. I kind of think of them as kind of like a a nicely dressed gentleman in a black suit, but he's got you know just a little bit of a a tie to show him off, you know, his necktie um, there. Um, they're very similar when you see them from a distance to these black fronted nun birds, um, but you can tell them apart almost instantly if you can pick up the red bill. Um, even though uh, the puff bird's more like a swallow than the, the nun birds, when you see them in the distance, they're often at first glance hard to tell apart. And then one of the, the, the common Swifts down there is the brown-chested martin. Um, it's really hard in this picture, and, it, and most of the time when you see them, to see any brown on their chest. I always was asking myself, why do they call that self that a brown-chested martin? But this one, as you can see, has a little bit of a brown spot uh, there on, on the chest or up on the, uh, below the, the neck. Um, so you see them and you think, Oh, what what do we have there? You know, um, but that's what that's what they are. They're brown-chested martins. Uh, see them all over the place, almost as um, ubiquitous as uh, some of the swallows or swifts that we might see around here. Um, Smooth-billed annies are the the uh, most common of the uh, annies you see down there. There's there's three varieties: the large build, the smooth build, and the groove build. Um, but the only ones we saw in the Amazon uh, were the smooth-billed annies. Again, very, very common, kind of a, just a black cuckoo is what it is. Um, and then the yellow-hooded blackbird. If you've seen the yellow-headed blackbird in the United States, it's, this is very similar to it, um, but the hood, and it's hard to see in this picture, but you can see between the leaves, the hood extends a little bit further down and comes to almost like a V uh, on, on the front of the bird, uh, something that you uh, don't quite see, not as extensive on the yellow-headed blackbirds that we have in the United States. Um, they, these birds uh, on the Amazon tend to skulk in the, the weeds, uh, the vegetation along the, the river bank, and this is kind of a typical view you would get of a yellow hooded blackbird along the rivers. You do get herons and egrets down there, uh, snowy egrets, of course, uh, you might have seen in the United States, and this was a big group of them that we uh, went by one day. And the first thing you think of when you see the cocoa heron is great blue heron, but it's not, uh, it's a different species altogether. 
Uh, they're fairly uh, common down there, just about as common as uh, a great blue heron would be uh, here in Ohio. We also saw striated herons. Uh, now, striated herons have an interesting distribution because striated herons can also be found in Africa. Uh, I think we saw them in Zimbabwe last last uh, year. Um, so the striated heron, um, pretty common uh, along the riverbanks. Um, you also can find other things, much less common, the rufescent tiger heron. Uh, I love this nice pattern on the back of the rufescent tiger heron. Um, and then a, a bird that likes to skulk so much so that I saw but never could get a picture of. They skulk along the sides of the banks. The cap heron, I had to borrow this uh, photo, but they, the, the cap heron stands out not only because it has this dark cap, but especially because of that blue bill. Um, and, and that... You know, you you know what you're seeing as soon as you saw it, and unfortunately, I got to see it, and I don't think my wife ever got to see one. Um, but they uh, are very difficult to actually get a photo of because they're they're skulking along uh, the in the sides of the, the riverbanks in the um, vegetation. These are kind of some look at that birds, um, the Hudson. That is, that is not a, a, a frightened turkey. Okay. Um, one of the iconic birds of the uh, Amazon basin is the Hudson. Uh, they're communal birds. Uh, it's oftentimes you find them in groups of two or three or four. Um, they have that very interesting uh, crest on top. And even the, the people on our trip who weren't birders were ooing and eyeing over the Hudson's. Um, because they are such an unusual uh, looking bird. Um, they are a, about the size of a small turkey, I'd say. Um, you know, a full grown uh, wild turkey would be a little bit bigger than this. Um, but they're hard to miss uh, when they're on a, a tree trunk beside the river. Uh, this bird, the Spix's guan, uh, was kind of an interesting thing. Um, our naturalist guides saw that up in the tree. Um, and they didn't know it was a guan. They couldn't figure out what it was. And it wasn't until I got back and looked at my photo and did a little analyzing to figure out it was Spix's guan. Now, Spix was a uh, naturalist. He was a German naturalist who uh, went to South America in the late 19th, early 20th century and has several um, wildlife species named after him. Uh, this, this fellow was up way up in the, the canopy, um, hopping around the tree. Uh, there was a second one that, uh, we never got a great look at. We could just tell there was another black bird up there, but I'm pretty sure it was another Spixis Guan. Uh, our, our guides at first thought it was a Curacao. We never did see a Curacao uh, on the Amazon, but we did find the, the Spixis Guan. Um, Amazon kingfisher, uh, again, you, a fairly widespread. You can find them uh, as far north as Panama, at least. Um, but very handsome bird. Um, I'd say maybe slightly bigger uh, than our belted kingfisher. Um, and, and fairly common. But the only squirrel cuckoo we saw is this one right here. Um, and again, they come in a couple of varieties. Michelle, if you could uh, click on the, the cuckoo. So this is the Amazonian variety. Uh, and this is a picture I took in Guatemala, I think, uh, of a squirrel cuckoo. And they are different varieties. And the main way to tell them apart, you have to look closely, is notice the eye. There's a red orbital around the eye, which makes that red eye really stand out where if you look at the one from Central America, you can see there's kind of a green orbital around the eye and a little bit of green at the lowers there too. Um, and that's kind of the major difference between the two varieties. They're considered one uh, species presently. Uh, I don't think there's any movement to split them into two, uh, but you do get kind of a, a different variety. And this one almost looks a little bit more evil when you see it because of that, uh, 
that red orbital uh, around the eye. Okay, if you could click again on the, we'll go back, yeah. Uh, then we came across these birds. They were in a mixed flock together. And at first, having never seen either one, we were wondering whether this was kind of a juvenile of that, but it turns out they aren't. They're two different birds. So the one on the left, the red cap cardinal is actually a tanager. Um, yeah, and there were several of them, uh, uh, in the same kind of area as these, uh, other birds. This is one of the few tanagers we saw, uh, you know, outside the city. Um, but uh, we saw them fairly frequently. I said several times uh, we came across those red cap cardinals. Uh, quite a striking bird with that kind of silver beak and the, the black kind of uh, throat there, the white here, and then uh, the black mantle. Um, the, the combinations of colors all, almost remind me of a red-headed woodpecker, but obviously it's not a woodpecker. And then with them, we had the uh, black-capped Donacobius. Um, interesting bird. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's um, a monogenetic bird. It's the only bird in its genus. They don't know exactly where to put this. This genus, if you look to taxonomies, uh, the history of bird taxonomy over the past 30 years, uh, they've moved this genus around here and there and everywhere. I think right now it's it's seen as an ally of the tanagers, um, but um, you know it's moved around the taxonomy uh, over the years. Um, they're they're cute little birds, and in their own way, I think they're quite striking with the black cap and the the brown back and and the nice kind of pale. I don't know what you call that pale yellow or buffy maybe uh, breast and throat, um, white tail. Uh, they they stand out quite nicely. Uh, I think when we saw them with the red cap cardinals was the only time we saw them. Uh, and our, our guide was all excited about that. You get to see black cap Donacobius. Um, so that was, that was quite the thing to see. Um, as you might, might expect a lot of, uh, parrots and parakeets, the most common parrot you're going to find down there almost every day we saw festive parrots flying or up in the trees, squawking, uh, a lot of uh, them. The only time we saw a Tui parakeet was one time when we got out of a boat and we were um, going back in the forest to look at giant lily pads. They have these huge lily pads. And he was in a tree right, uh, right beside the, the little bridge we were going over to get back to, to see them. And so we saw this little uh, Tui parakeet and I, I felt very lucky to even get a, a photo of them. But again, they're, they're a very small bird, um, as you might imagine for a parakeet, but they stand out pretty good with this little yellow on the forehead and red on the beak. Uh, you notice them right away. We did see this mealy parrot. Um, not a, a completely uncommon bird, but um, I think this was the only one we saw there. Um, I do like their their little yellow tail and their the little red that they have on the side. And then as we were going, I mentioned the uh, we're going to uh, the old city of Orion. We were out on our skiffs um, going to get onto land. And in the bushes, there was uh, a, an entire flock of dusky parrots. And again, our uh, guides got um, very, very excited because they said, you know, you never get this close to them. And we were maybe, the closest ones were maybe 10 feet away uh, in these bushes that were growing right out of the bank uh, of the river. Um, they look almost prehistoric. Um, but uh, they were all excited that we got to to get that close to the, the dusky parrots. And wouldn't you know, they were there when we came. We walked all the way through old Arayo, saw the ruins and everything. And we came back an hour and a half later and they were still there. They hadn't moved. So we got uh, two chances to see the dusky parrots. Um, scarlet macaws, um, we never saw these very close up. These are pictures I took 
at dawn when we were looking at those lily pads. Uh, it was shortly after dawn, and they came flying toward us. Um, not the best light. That's why they look the way they are. Um, but we saw scarlet macaws on several occasions, but never very close up. Uh, they do fly around, especially in the morning. Uh, you'll catch them active. Um, quite a striking bird. If you've never seen uh, Scarlet Macaw, it's, it's something worth seeing. So th that red is uh, really brilliant. And the long tail, um, they're, they're fun to see. Uh, we also saw blue and yellow macaws. And these fellas, um, cooperatively enough, pose so you can see both their breast and their back. Um, they were fairly common uh, along the Amazon and its uh, tributaries, but you'd see them way high up in trees. Uh, and if you don't have a good lens, uh, you're not going to get a good picture of them because they don't come down uh, to the river, but they're uh, fairly common. Uh, we stopped at a um, native village uh, and got a kind of a dance show from the natives uh, there. And in their meeting hall that we were in um seeing this thing they had a pet macaw the i guess a macaw that they had tamed and uh it was up in the rafters you know and we could see the macaw up there uh while they were you know down below doing their uh, native dances for us so uh they are fairly common and apparently you can uh, tame them to some extent uh, because they had done that Toucans. Uh, I don't have good pictures of toucans. I wish I did. These are the best I could do. Uh, Chestnut-eared arasari. Um, arasaris are uh, usually smaller uh, toucans, and it's hard to see the chestnut ear that he's known for because the, the light wasn't very good. It was early morning, and he was against the sky. Uh, but we did see chestnut-eared arasari, and we very commonly saw white-throated toucans, but again, uh, never close up. We saw them a lot uh, flying around, especially in the morning hours. You can see them flying along the trees along the riverbanks. These two here uh, were perched in a tree, and I managed to get kind of a, a photo of them. Uh, they're probably the most common toucans you're going to see in this part of the Amazon um, because we would see them, oh, I'd say about half the mornings we were uh, out, we would see these toucans flying. A uh, good number of raptors along the Amazon. Um, greater yellow-headed vulture. Uh, yes, there is a lesser yellow-headed vulture too, but uh, we did see one greater yellow-headed vulture uh, one of the early days that we were out, and we never saw another one again, um, but they're around. And one of my favorite uh, vultures, maybe my favorite vulture, is what I think is a very majestic-looking vulture, the king vulture. Uh, Widespread again, you can find them in South America, and we've seen them in um, Central America too. Um, this fellow was kind enough to fly right over our skiff, so I got a nice uh, photo of him one afternoon as we were out on the skiffs. Now, the other thing about birding in this part, and not only do you do it on the skiffs, but you do it early morning and late afternoon. So you go out early morning before breakfast, an hour and a half or so, you see what you can see, all the wildlife you can see, and then it's too hot and too sticky. So we're back on the boat, and about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we get back on the skiffs and we go out again, um, and we see birds in the afternoon. Um, other birds... Um, very common yellow-headed caracar, again, widespread bird. You can see them in Central America, too. This one was kind enough to fly over our boat. We were standing on the upper deck of that boat I showed you, uh, and he flew right over us and gave us a, a very nice view. And then black caracaras, uh, also along the bank of the river. Um, and they're kind of a plane if it wasn't for the fact that they have this orange uh, face where, where they have just their skin and, and no, um, no, no feathers like other, um, well, like, like some uh, vultures. Um, roadside hawks are probably the, f the most common raptor you're going to see down there. And fortunately, we, 
we saw a lot of them. And this is a picture from the rear where you can see what their their wings and their back looks like. Uh, this is a picture from the front. They have uh, kind of a um, barred front on their breasts there. So very common. And almost as common were the black collared hawks. It's hard to see in these pictures, but they do actually have a black collar. When you see them kind of straight on, you see a black uh, collar. Very rare to see. And again, our, our guides got all excited when, when we spotted this was a great black hawk. Um, the only one we saw on the trip, uh, I got to snap off a few pictures of him. Um, he is quite a large hawk when you see it, you know, and he's aptly named. Um, you might have seen uh, the lesser black hawk again if you've if you've been to Central America or even uh, some southern parts of the United States. Sometimes you can see uh, a lesser black hawk, but this this uh, fellow is is much larger. We I think we saw lesser black hawks in Texas at one point, um, and this this guy's clearly much bigger. Um, falcons uh, and kites. Uh, bat falcons were, we only saw them active in the very early morning, which explains why I don't have a picture with great definition because there was not an, a lot of light there. Um, but two or three mornings we saw bat falcons, sometimes as many as three, um, in a group, uh, hunting, uh, just after dawn. Um, and the interesting thing was these were our first bat falcons, um, they're supposed to be fairly common, and we've been to, to Southern Central America where you're supposed to be able to see them, even as far north as Guatemala. Um, and um, they are often can be confused with orange-breasted falcons, which are much rarer. And we, ironically, we had seen an orange-breasted falcon, but we had never seen pet falcons. So we kind of uh, corrected that. The plumbius kite is named after the fact that he is lead colored, plumbius, right? I mean, lead colored. Um, and um, they're not real common. I think we saw one or two on this trip and that was it. Um, but they're again out usually in the early morning or in the uh, late evening, uh, you can see them. The rest of the time, uh, you don't see them out and about. Finches. Uh, we didn't see a lot of finches, but one day uh, along the riverbank, uh, among these uh, grasses with their uh, seeds, we saw uh, a flock of orange-crowned yellow finches. Uh, the males are, are very striking, bright yellow with this, this orange crown. The females, uh, obviously a dimorphic uh, species because they are much less brightly colored. Um, but really, we saw only this one flock of maybe 20 or so along the riverbank, one of the last days we were on the river. Then there's birds that are, are really shy, hard to, to find. Uh, the chestnut crowned Picard, um, we saw way off in the distance. I was lucky to get my lens on it and get a picture, a halfway decent picture of the chestnut Crown Picard. Again, our guides were all excited because they said that's a you actually saw one. The guide wasn't with us when we saw one. I said, Yeah, we actually I actually got a photo of it. And he said, Well, those are really rare. And then not uncommon, but hard to see close up are red-breasted meadowlarks. They they are very shy about human presence. Uh, and we this one was maybe a hundred yards away. I was lucky to get as good a picture as I did. Um, because it was like, you know, a football field away. Um, but there were a whole group of them. And we saw groups of them several times along the Amazon, but um, they are very, very uh, shy and, and hard to see up close. Uh, used to be called uh, red-breasted, it used to be called some type of robin, uh, but they've renamed it meadowlark because it's actually in the meadowlark family it's not in the thrush family like our american robins and it's certainly not in the warbler family like european robins uh the only woodpecker we saw was a yellow tufted woodpecker 
quite striking. Um, this again is not my photo. The photo I got, uh, he was kind of sticking his head out from behind a tree, not very good light. Um, and I kind of wanted to see, show you how striking they are. Um, you know, when you, when you see them, you go, wow, that's, that's quite a striking woodpecker. The only one we saw, uh, interestingly enough, we, we saw only this one species and only one example of the time we were there. Uh, and then we found this mystery bird. We were along the river. Our guides didn't even know what it was. What is this bird? We had to go back, look it up, and it turns out it's a white-browed purple tuft. And I, I'm sure I'm running out of time here, so I'll try to speed it up. Um, the reason our guides never uh, had seen this is it's a bird that's usually in the canopies way up high. Um but it happened to be down along the river. So we actually got to see uh, a little flock, maybe six or seven uh, white-browed purple tufts. They don't always show their purple tufts. Uh, this is in the Cotinga family. So if you've seen Cotingas, this is the same family. We did some night birding. Uh, what did we see? We saw, well, I took this picture at night, Nakunda nighthawk. Common Paraki, which we saw, but this is a picture I took in Texas and common patu, uh, which I took in Tobago. In addition, we saw great patu and ladder-tailed nightjar, but all of these are at night, well, we took at night, and so the only one I got a, a, even a halfway decent season picture of because it was nighttime, it's a nighthawk. Very quickly, you can fish the Amazon. There's the master fisher now. Uh, she caught herself uh, a nice piranha uh, and our group caught a whole bunch of piranhas and they made piranha soup out of it for us. And let me tell you, it doesn't taste like much. Not worth the effort. Um, you can see mammals down there. Uh, the Brazilian slender possum, uh, very interesting. And as you can see, much skinnier than ours. Um, Brown-throated sloth is the common sloth you see down there. And we saw sloths at night. We saw sloths during the day. They seem to be everywhere. Um, Colombian red howler monkey, uh, a very common howler monkey down there. Um, bats, these are probis proboscis bats. Uh, here's a whole bunch of them on the side uh, of a tree. Uh, so yeah, you can see the bats down there during the day uh, kind of hanging out on the trees. Amazon river dolphins, pink dolphins. The older they get, the pinker they are. Um, so we saw pink dolphins, uh, common squirrel monkeys, of course, and white fast uh, capuchin monkeys uh, are also mammals you can see down there. He's not fast. Uh, if you're down there at the end of the rainy season, like we are, the flowers are gorgeous. So here's just a few examples of the flowers we saw. Um, they're absolutely um, amazing at this time of year. It was just the end of the wet season, going into the dry season. Uh, and so everything was in bloom. And then we saw this pink pooey, and we saw this thing buzzing around and it was going in and out like a hummingbird. And we were a, a little bit distance away. Again, keep in mind, I have a telephoto lens. And we thought, is that a really small hummingbird? Because the only hummingbirds we saw were way up in the canopy again, couldn't identify them. It turned out, no, it's a neotropical cuckoo wasp. Um, and look at that green wasp. How about that? So that was our trip on the Amazon. Uh, and our time is of about the end. Uh, this is going back to Manas on our boat. I had a great time. Uh, I'd recommend it uh, as, a, as a trip. It was a nice 10 days that uh, we spent down there, even if it did take us two days to go down and back. So thank you for your attention. We can entertain maybe one question from our live audience. And if anybody uh, on Zoom has a question, we'll come with the... Anybody in the live audience, dead audience, whatever. On Zoom, if you have a question, you can feel free to chat or um, yeah, just chat and let me know when I can take you off mute to speak your question. All right, I'll, I'll pose a question 
the the pink dolphins the were you, was that you guys touching it or were you able you, to people yeah you could get down you could get down on a platform and they had some type of um fish or something that they were drawing the dolphins in with yeah so yeah that that would be worth it <laughs> yeah yeah and we even got to swim in the river so we we swam in the river one day um it wasn't it wasn't too bad obviously no piranhas <laughs> all right so I guess without any questions, we want to thank you again for your oh, for the travelogue. I want to go to the Amazon again. I've been there yeah. once. Uh, and yeah, it's it's a fabulous place. So uh, but thank you so much. And remember, next month, Zoom only. So don't show up here unless you want to vote. Maybe you live in the <laughs> maybe you live in the neighborhood. So all right, thank you again, thank everyone. You.